be with you all today and to welcome you all uh, and our panelists to this special event on human rights challenges in addressing and countering all aspects of the World Drug Program. At the outset, I really want to thank our co-sponsors. <clears throat> See, I'm gonna need that water, thank you. Our co-sponsors for this event, uh, a nice long list, which is the way we like to see it. Albania, Belgium, Bolivia, Canada, Colombia, Czechia, uh, Greece, Guatemala, Mexico, uh, Norway, Paraguay, Portugal, Uruguay, Switzerland, the European Union and its member states, the uh, UNDP, uh, UNAIDS, <clears throat> the World Health Organization, the Global Commission on Drug Policy, the International Drug Policy Consortium, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, and the Open Society Foundations. So thank you all for, for your support. And we want to um, specifically thank uh, Switzerland for their contribution of refreshments and invite us you all to join us uh, to continue the discussion afterwards outside where that will be served. And we also want to thank our partner who I met earlier, thank you over there, uh, the International Drug Policy Consortium who have helped us with the technical arrangements for the webcast and its recording. So with those introductory remarks, let me, let me just start us off by saying that I'm coming here from a whirlwind of activity in Geneva around the Universal Declaration for Human Rights 75th anniversary, which is happening this weekend and is being uh, celebrated by us in Geneva with a, a sort of worldwide event uh, on the 11th and 12th. And I come to that uh, discussion with, with a lot of, uh, at times, uh, questions. People are saying, is it a good moment to be really focusing on human rights? Is it, uh, there's, there's too much going on in the world today. Um, and is, is it the right conversation to be having? And I know that the high commissioners reply on that is that it's actually exactly because there is so much going on in the world right now that we need to have these conversations. We need to be engaged on these important issues. And I felt that same way looking at the agenda and discussion that we're going to have today. We know that uh, we're meeting as states right now are preparing the 2024 midterm review of the 2019 ministerial declaration on persistent and emerging challenges relating to the world drug problem. And the 2024 midterm review provides us a space for that incredibly important reflection and consideration to take stock of the results to date and to look forward uh, to planning what ground should be covered by drug policies uh, by 2029. The midterm review provides an opportunity for states to renew and strengthen their commitment to human rights as part of transformative change to address the global drug situation. Indeed, there's a need for a robust human rights-based and sustainable development-led approach to drug policy. Without such an approach, drug control efforts are likely to impede progress towards achieving the 2030 agenda and leaving no one behind. In this regard, in this message to the 66th session of the CND, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, urged states to, quote, focus on transformative change, crafting drug policies which are based on evidence, which put human rights at their center, which are gender sensitive, and which ultimately improve the lives of millions of individuals affected. The obvious question then arises, what bold measures are needed for such transformative change? Uh, OHCHR's report, the, entitled Human Rights Challenges in Addressing and Countering All Aspects of the World Drug Program, is our attempt to answer that tough question. The report was prepared pursuant to resolution of the UN Human Rights Council as a contribution to the midterm review of the 2019 Ministerial Declaration and was presented to the Human Rights Council in September of this year. It was also shared with the Commission on Nar Narcotic Drugs at the Human Rights Council's request. The report highlights key concerns, including lack of and unequal transis, uh, uh, access to treatment and harm reduction, the war on drugs and militarization of drug control, over-incarceration and prison over overcrowding, the use of death penalty for drug-related offenses, and the disproportionate impact of punitive drug policies on youth, people of African descent, indigenous peoples, and women. The report also makes a number of recommendations to address those concerns. So uh, that's an introduction into where we're, where we're heading. But before uh, moving over to our panel, I'd very much like to give the floor to my 
the esteemed uh, ambassadors that we have with us today uh, to start us off on this conversation. So without further ado, I, I'll um, ask Ambassador Rafael Nageli, the uh, permanent rep of Switzerland to take the floor, please. Thank you, Peggy, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to, to speak at the opening of, uh, of this event and uh, many thanks to uh, OHCHR for bringing us together on this, on this uh, subject. And many thanks to the panelists uh, for, for what they will, will, will say uh, just, just in, a, in a moment. In April this year, the Human Rights Council has adopted the very important resolution uh, 5224. This resolution rec recognizes the need for states to create an environment that ensures the highest attainable standards of physical and mental health for everyone. The Council requests the OHCHR to prepare a report on human rights challenges regarding the world of the, uh, the, the world drug situation. That's what we are going to discuss today. The report identifies human rights challenges. It tracks recent developments and it makes recommendations on the way forward in the context of the 2024 midterm review. Uh, allow me to take the opportunity to highlight a few key topics of the report. Uh, first, while there is an increase uh, of drug use, the access to drug treatment services is being challenged and it remains largely unmet. Second, uh, punitive drug control laws, policies and law enforcement practices are among the main obstacles to people's ab ability to enter drug treatment programs. And third, non-voluntary, compulsory and coercive treatments persist and they are posing a serious threat to human dignity and rights. The report is calling for measures such as the expansion of harm reduction programs, affordable access to internationally controlled essential uh, medicines, the prohibition of compulsory drug rehabilitation, as well as needle and syringe exchange programs, also in prison settings. We are pleased to see that harm reduction measures are a part, uh, essential part of the report. As you know, Switzerland has a long tradition uh, in this area. And therefore, it's also an honor to me uh, to welcome Ruth Dreyfus uh, uh, among this panel. Ruth Dreyfus is a former Swiss president, uh, but she was also the one led, uh, leading the foundations of the Swiss drug policy during her term as uh, Minister of Health in Switzerland, and she will speak just in a minute. Um, the report states that repressive approaches to drug control have led to prison overcrowding, extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detention, ill treatment, and other human rights violations. According to the report, drug policies disproportionately affect the poorest and the most marginalized populations. They can have particular negative impact on women, on youth, on people of African descent, on indigenous people, and on other marginal uh, groups of population. Women may fa face a higher level of stigma, hurdles, and discrimination than men who use drugs. States, therefore, should provide gender-sensitive services. To conclude, uh, allow me to highlight the positive uh, development. The report also states that important progress has been achieved in recent years to move from a punitive uh, to a health and human rights based uh, approach to drugs at national levels in different parts of the world and in many countries. This is a positive development and I hope it will continue. Switzerland stays committed to promote the health and human rights centered approach in order to meet all the challenges that we are facing. We are pleased to hear more about the report in today's event, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It's uh, wonderful to, to hear your remarks and, as you said, to, to think about the progress and how we how we continue that. Um, we're also very fortunate to have with us Ambassador Laura Gill, the permanent representative of Colombia to the UN in Vienna. Please. Well, thank you. And first of all, a big thanks to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and all the delegations for co-sponsoring this event. Colombia is very pleased to see this human rights report um, following resolution 5224 of the Human Rights Council, um, because we think it contributes to think about international um, drug policy, to rethink international drug policy. Since his very first address at uh, the United General, General Assembly in September 2022, my president, President Petro, made a global call for a new approach to an international drug policy from a, with a human rights perspective. Our challenge, he said, is to overcome pro prohibition as the dominant paradigm and implement the strategies that address the structural causes of this phenomenon. 
And a similar call was made by a group of states at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. In this report, we feel not only that the voice of Colombians was heard, but that an important contribution was made to establish a more coordinated and linked dialogue between the UN agencies in Geneva and Vienna. Well, we're very pleased to see um, that the report provides a relevant, relevant overview of development, developments towards a more human rights centered drug policy. And one of the fundamental elements that Colombia sees in this report is their urgent call for a shift from punitive measures to the use of policies ground, grounded in human rights and public health. In line with this approach, our government designed a new drug policy um, that was consulted with more than 2,700 social leaders around, around the country and 274 NGOs. Uh, and we have decided to do so because as you know, we are the country that, most, that suffered the most from the impact of the failure of the so-called war on drugs. Um, the Truth Commission in Colombia identified drug trafficking as a factor of persistence of the conflict and violence in Colombia. And I wanna stop on this point because I think it really, really matters. All the armed actors in Colombia were and are involved in drug trafficking. So tell me, do you think it's because we Colombians are more violent than other societies? Do you think we are born with some DNA uh, that makes us violent? No, that is not so. It's because of drug trafficking. Colombia needs to solve this situation hmm? in order to overcome the violence that keeps us from jumping to another state another level of development. So um, after years and years of seeing that consumption of illegal substances does not decrease, we share the view that we need to bring a more um, modernized uh, uh, approach to the, to, to um, to international drug policy. One that actually recognized was actually on the ground, not one that gives its back to reality. 17, 75 years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and 30 years after the Vienna Conference on Human Rights, Colombia shares a call made by the Secretary General to promote the global consensus around the Universal Declaration and to move forward into a new era of human rights and a new social contract. And we will not do so if international drug policy remains what it is. So I will say, I would like to leave you with these three messages. Colombia believes that if we have a report, it's not to be transmitted to Vienna so that the report is buried under paperwork. If we have the report, it's because we want the report to be discussed here and we want to have an impact here. Now, we're absolutely convinced, of course, that this report recom includes recommendations and that it is the beginning of a discussion, not the end of the discussion. We understand that but it has to be taken as the beginning of a conversation. Colombia will not relent on its commitments to human rights in international drug policy. Colombia will keep the conversation going. And my final observation is the following. I'm not speaking empty words. We are committed to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think uh, and I hope that your passion for the subject is, is infectious. 
um, and that, that we can, uh, I think both of our introductory speakers emphasize the need for policies grounded in human rights and public health and what that shift would mean. Um, and you've given us a vibrant example of what it would mean in Colombia. Um, so plenty for us to discuss and we have a wonderful panel with us to help us do that. Um, I think I, I uh, abundance of riches here in terms of who I should turn to first, but in my, in my program, I see uh, Yindrich, you're, you're first on, on a call here. Uh, Yindrich uh, Voberel, who's the national drug coordinator of Czechia and is a, a well-known authority in this area. We're really looking forward to hearing your comments, please. Thank you. It's an honor to be invited to this panel. I hope um, we're not going to, in future, only talk to the converted, I mean, preach to the converted, but we will spread the message a little bit outside of this room. Um, let me point a few facts, which we all know, but I'm thinking it's important to, to remind ourselves over and over. Um, 1998, we said, uh, the world free of drugs, we can do it. So um, look where we are now. Uh, <clears throat> the World Drug Report 2022 says 284 million people age 15 to 64 use drugs worldwide. The report 2023, 2096 million people so we have a rise. The last decade, it's 23% of the rise of the previous decade. So this is the world free of drugs. Number of people imprisoned and executed and murdered is on the rise. According to the Harm Reduction International Report 2021, uh, I hope I will not uh, steal ideas from other speakers but maybe it's good to, to repeat certain, uh, certain uh, numbers. <clears throat> One in five people in prison worldwide is held for drug offenses. 90% of people who inject drugs will be in prison, in prison at some point in their life. 90% of people who are users, who are the victims, are going to be in prison once, uh, at least once in their life. 2 million people uh, incarcerated for drug offenses globally. So uh, the, the, the Human Rights High Commissioner report speaks about decriminalization, which is, uh, we uh, highly appreciated that report and we did as much as possible in Czech Republic to spread the, the, the word across. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, uh, 191 countries, as the report also points out, worldwide still criminalize people for simple use. For simple use. It's uh, uh, people that are actually diagnosable or diagnosed according to medical manual uh, with the diagnosis with, uh, from F10 to F19. So they're ill people who should be uh, helped, not, not in prison, if anything. Of course, uh, I have all the numbers. I don't want to because it's many of us about HIV hepatitis. Uh, we know that this is a big trouble, and WHO was talking about it over and over and over for many years. Uh, there's one one little point as well, which I think is important and is attached to stigma, is that uh, women are actually uh, more. Uh, 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 um, often living with HIV than, than men, and it's not attached to sex industry. It's because the stigma doesn't allow women to come forward to ask for help, simplifying it. <clears throat> Let me also touch the organized crime network uh, continues to operate globally and grow in every year. Uh, recent unclassified uh, CIA reports and other reports from uh, uh, other intelligent, uh, intelligence agencies uh, point out that uh, a lot of this organized crime today is actually dominated by people close to Russian government, uh, namely 
people like Viktor Ivanov, who was my counterpart until recently in Russia, uh, who is in suspicion of uh, of uh, being on top of the uh, big global uh, cocaine routes um, since 80s. <clears throat> uh, so we know that uh, this is also money that flows to terrorism, to wars. <clears throat> Uh, so what is the solution? Uh, of course, we have a dominating policy approach, which is abstinence. What is the other solution? The other solution, as we know, the only other solution in all addiction, it's not only drugs, it's also tobacco, it's also gambling. Uh, the other possible solution is minimizing harms and risks, harm reduction approach, as the High Commissioner pointed out. Uh, and uh, let me try to to kind of uh, uh, define a new uh, word, which uh, I, I, it's not fully ready, but I'm trying to still kind of uh, think how to how to how to define it. I think we need something that we that is called that we would could call substitution policy. I don't mean substitution from the health care point of view, but uh, uh, we in Czech Republic, our government uh, have a program approved, which says in the main preamble that we support uh, policies that will regulate market of addictive substances and products according to their risks. And we know it from many, many numbers. I don't want to bore you and, and we have no time to, to go through different uh, situations. I will pick only one. Uh, that um, if there is on the market uh, less risky product, uh, market uh, will behave in such a way that people will rather, rather use the less risky uh, substances if they are regulating uh, access legally accessible legally. So uh, one uh, example is uh, we reduced, in Czech Republic reduced um, number of heroin users from estimation of 14,000. Our main problem is methamphetamine, but from 14,000 of uh, heroin users to, to about 3,000 because we widely allowed uh, Subotex. <clears throat> uh, of course, it's also on, on the black market, but people uh, people don't have to uh, use so much money for Subutex. So this is an example or, or a possibility how to go forward. We have a new bill now in, in the Czech parliament where we want to, to, to introduce a regulate, regulated market with substances which are not uh, which are not uh, internationally regulated because it's easier legally, such as Kratom of AHC, instead of putting it on prohibit prohibition list, uh, we want to regulate it uh, in a by market, regulated market. So uh, last last sentence I was I want to say to continue with prohibition. Uh, it's not only inhumane, it's against any evidence today, and it's, uh, it's supporting wars and terrorism today. So let me use a sentence from a Bible. Uh, one important person from the history says uh, in the Bible, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn who it is. I want mercy, not sacrifice. Thank you very much for those remarks. Plenty for us to, to follow up and think about. Um, I'm now going to turn the floor to Ruth Dreyfus, who I'm sure is well known to all of you and already been given an introduction by the ambassador. Uh, her longtime work on, on these issues in Switzerland and beyond is is well known as uh, Commissioner of the Global Com uh, Commission on Drug Policy. Over to you, please. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor, but it is also a great pleasure to speak uh, uh, at this event as a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. 
our deep gratitude goes to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights for organizing this event, and moreover for delivering an exceptional and pragmatic report on the issue on, of drug policy. The Global Commission commends the way the Office realized the request from the Council of Human Rights to realize an analysis on human rights challenges in addressing and countering all aspects of the world drug problem. We consider it is a valuable and necessary contribution to the midterm review of the 2019 ministerial declaration. For the 29 members of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, human rights should be the fundament of drug policies on international and on national levels. Drug policy should be congruent with the principles and objectives of the United Nations as a whole. This means that a strong collaboration between all the agencies is needed in order to reach a coherence in a horizontal issue tackling with so many different aspects and having so multifaceted consequences on individuals and on society. Many progresses has been realized since the 2016 UN session special dedicated to drug policy. Considering the five pathway recommended by the Global Commission, let me briefly mention first the health aspect. There is now a larger recognition that harm reduction measures and treatments responding to the different needs, wishes, and capacities of people suffering addiction. But there is still a lack, a lack of and unequal access to treatments and harm reduction, which is emphasized in the uh, report of the Office of the High Commissioner. Second, Another aspect of the public health is the failure to achieve the objective of ensuring access to controlled medicine. There is a broad consensus that this should change, but the reality is still that an overwhelming majority of the world population is suffering avoidable pain. The Office of the High Commissioner is right in considering that this represents a serious violation of human rights. Third, the Global Commission is advocating for the decriminalization of people who use drugs. As a principle, we consider that punishing people for conduct that are not harming others is violating the right to privacy. But even more important in practical terms are the consequences of the punitive approach the over-incarceration of consumers, their exposure to health risk and degrading and humiliating treatments, the limitation of access to jobs, to housing, to medical and social service, the destruction of family ties and many more. Petty non-violent criminals at the bottom of the trafficking pyramid are still in many countries, victim of disproportionate punishment long imprisonment, death penalty, lack of protection against extortion, violence, murder, without consideration to their social marginalization and their lack of other economic opportunities, without the necessary discretion of the courts and the assurance of fair trials. The awareness about the negation of human rights and the ineffectiveness of this punitive approach has progressed but in a insufficient way, considering the huge number to take just one example of the prison population and how it is largely due to the punishing approach to drugs. Fourth, when the Global Commission recommends to focus enforcement responses at the real summit of the organized crime, it is not supporting the militarization of the war on drugs knowing how many innocent people are killed, injured, or, or displaced because they are trapped between the lines. The weakening of the rule of law and democracy are also consequences of the violence of such a fight. We witness a growing awareness about the collateral damage of this approach and about the fact that international exchange of intelligence 
the fight against corruption and money laundering are the tools which are far more effective in responding to international criminal organization. I commend the Office of the High Commissioner for putting in evidence the consequences in terms of human rights of the militarization of the war on drugs. And fifth, since its setting up, the Global Commission recommends to put governments in control of the drugs. As it is in control of legal psychoactive substances and a whole range of products potentially harmful for people, their environment, and the climate. We especially support the uh, recommendation of the uh, High uh, Commissioner and its office, the recommendation C, in the fin final paragraph of the report. It says, consider developing a regulatory system for legal access to controlled substances. That does mean, in our view, that we have to overcome some, some inherent contradictions between the human rights and health-oriented approach to the drug problems and the punitive approach. There is a long way to go between prohibition and legal regulation of production and markets. It is therefore necessary to allow and promote cautious experimentation of regulations model through an incremental regulation of lower potency drugs first. It is also necessary to learn from successes and failure in regulating alcohol, tobacco, and medicine from also other fields of regulation like those of, on pesticides or other chemicals in housing, on the mitigation of the harms for human and the environment. The threat of over-commercialization and empowerment of private interest must, must also be taken into account. Entering in such a process of preparing the possibility of legal regulation should be based on the participation of the people and communities most affected by the consequences of prohibition and open a large, well-informed political debate. The regulation of drugs should be pursued because they are risky, not because they are safe, and because the black market makes them more risky. Ultimately, this is a choice between control in the hands of governments or in the hands of criminal groups. This dilemma cannot remain a taboo, thanks to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to spell it out. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think the, the elaboration of our report could have could have been put better. Thank you so much for, for your support and for the recommendations and work of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Um, we're turning next to, uh, we're fortunate to have with us uh, Christine uh, Stegling, who's the Deputy Executive Director of UNAIDS, and she'll be speaking by a video message. Please, over to the video. Thank you. Thank you to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, along with Colombia, Switzerland, Czechia, and other missions and agencies for organizing this important event. I'm sorry I could not be with you today, but I look forward to seeing you at the midterm review in March next year. I would like to first take the opportunity to congratulate OHCHR on an excellent report. For many years now at CND and elsewhere, there has been a strong recognition of the need for both a human rights and a public health approach to drug policy, along with commitments to take action. But promises have not led to programs. At the midterm review next year, we will be presented with a bleak picture. We are not on track. In the last five years, the number of countries with needle and syringe programs has not changed. And while there's a slight increase in the number of countries with opioid agonist treatment, still only 18% of people who inject drugs have access. It is true that we are seeing countries move towards a decriminalization approach. However, in many cases, it is replaced with equally punitive administrative approaches. The impact of our inaction is before our eyes. 
Among the general population, annual numbers of people acquiring HIV has reduced by 38% since 2010, 13% since 2019. However, among people who inject drugs, there has been no apparent change in infection rates. HIV prevalence is seven times that of the rest of the population. And in some countries, more than 50% of people who inject drugs are living with HIV. Since 2010, we have not moved. We are stuck. What is frustrating is that this is not rocket science. We have the tools and experience to take a human rights and public health approach. They work, they're efficient and affordable. The report of OHCHR lays out critical, actionable priorities that, from our perspective, are fundamental to redirecting drug policy towards health and rights and ending AIDS as a public health threat. I want to draw attention to four key recommendations in this report that are critical if we are to make any progress at all. We must introduce and scale up voluntary community-based harm reduction, the entire comprehensive package outlined in the WHO guidelines for key populations, but particularly in needle and syringe programs, opioid agonist therapy and overdose prevention. Where these programs are to scale, HIV incidence does decrease. Second, we must decriminalize drug use and make sure that in doing so, our administrative approaches don't recreate the harms of criminal laws. In the 2021 political declaration on HIV, states called for removal of laws that create barriers to accessing services, recognizing that it's not just criminal laws that can harm HIV outcomes. Third, the above two must be done in collaboration with communities, led by people who use drugs. This is critical if programs and law reform are to have any chance of success. Yes, as we, yet as we reported on World AIDS Day, two thirds of reporting countries said they do not involve people who inject drugs in HIV decision-making processes, rendering them the most excluded key population. Fourth, and finally, we must fund evidence-based public health programs for people who use drugs and the communities themselves. We estimate that 2.7 billion is needed every year for harm reduction, yet countries are reporting less than 1% of that in expenditures. When we go to the CND next year, I hope we can be honest in our assessment of where we are and practical discussions of where we need to be and how to get there. This report provides an excellent overview of the problems and shortcomings of the current approach and clear guidance on how to course correct. This is not about tinkering around the edges, but as outlined in this report about a fundamental shift in how we approach drug use and support our communities to lead. Thanks very much, Christine. Sorry you couldn't be with us directly, uh, but uh, the message has resonated here in the room. Uh, finally, and thank you for your patience, Anne, we're uh, going to turn to Anne Fordham, who is the Executive Director of the International Drug Policy Consortium. Really looking forward to your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the floor. IDBC is really pleased to co-host this um, important event with such a large and esteemed list of co-hosts. For those working on reforming global drug policy, the report that presented here today is truly historical and groundbreaking. For decades, the unrealistic goal of achieving a society free of drug abuse has driven drug policies based on prohibition, criminalization, and harsh punishment. Following the 2016 UNGAS, there's been growing emphasis in UN drug policy making on the health, human rights, and development dimensions. However, in reality, this rhetorical trend has not resulted in a true shift in national policies in many parts of the world. And with this report, the High Commissioner for Human Rights has unequivocally recognized that prohibitionist drug policies drive widespread human rights violations and fuel discrimination. When the report was released, 134 NGOs from all over the world joined a collective statement to welcome its findings and recommendations. And we recognize that the High Commissioner had provided a concrete set of recommendations to transform global drug policies away from the failed punitive paradigm. It's also heartening today to see that other key entities within the UN system are also vocally supporting this landmark report. 
UN system-wide coherence on drug policy has been a key advocacy objective for IDPC since our inception, as well as bringing the worlds of Vienna and Geneva closer together, which we're also doing here today with this event. So the question really is, what should member states do? What should be the next steps for countries that are committed to a human rights-based drug policy? I'll use my brief remarks to propose a few recommendations. Let me start with member state delegations and UN bodies working at the heart of the UN drug control regime here in Vienna. The reality is that UN drug control bodies have delivered very little progress on aligning human rights and drug policy. While it's clear and very welcome that human rights issues and human rights actors are increasingly visible and present here in Vienna, thanks largely to the tireless work of the OHCHR and many like-minded member states, the last CND resolution explicitly on human rights dates back to 2008, that's 15 years ago. When it comes to actual human rights language in the UN drug control setting, there's been almost no substantive progress since the 2016 UNGAS outcome document. We are yet to see a resolution that recognizes or encourages the contributions of human rights bodies here in Vienna. This stagnation stands in stark contrast with the new resolutions that are coming from the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council, which are bringing drug policy debates, um, bringing to the drug policy debates critical issues such as in the rights of indigenous peoples, farmers' rights, racial discrimination, and unequivocal support, unequivocal support for harm reduction. And if this is not resolved, the CND will become less productive and therefore a less relevant policymaking body. In addition, UNODC has done some important work on human rights at an operational level on certain issues such as compulsory drug detention and the HIV response for people who use drugs. However, in our view, the agency still fails to systematically place human rights at the center of its work. The clearest example of that includes, includes a lack of reference, evidence or recommendations on the human rights dimensions of drug policies in the World Drug Report or its silence in the face of grave human rights violations committed in the name of drug control, such as the death penalty. The lack of a forceful defense and promotion of the decriminalization of drug use and possession for personal use, a policy that is at the center of the UN common position on drugs is also very concerning. Facing these realities, the member states and UN entities, entities that are committed to aligning the global drug control regime with human rights need to take a step forward and coordinate in order to ensure that the human rights agenda has, a central space, has the central space in Vienna that it deserves. Some actions in that direction could include ensuring that the outcome document of the upcoming midterm review welcomes this new report by OHCHR and brings in the positive language developments on racial justice, indigenous people's rights and harm reduction that have emerged in the General Assembly and at the Human Rights Council. Member states could also consider introducing new resolutions on the human rights dimensions of drug policy. Member States should urge UNODC and its Executive Director to report consistently on the human rights dimensions of drug policy and to unequivocally call out human rights violations and to promote clearly harm reduction and decriminalization. And of course, OHCHR should continue to cooperate with OHCHR, sorry, UNODC should continue cooperating with OHCHR in order to support the continued presence of human rights experts at the CND. Let me conclude briefly with a recommendation also for Geneva. We have seen how OHCHR and human rights mechanisms are increasingly reporting on drug policy. Over the last decade, their contributions have changed the face of global drug policy debates, and the report that is being discussed here today is a culmination of that effort. However, the work of special procedure mandates has been limited in scope, depends on the personal interest of the mandate holders and lacks consistency. If we want to have a genuine understanding of the human rights dimensions of drug policy and to generate recommendations that will change the system, there are many topics that require more attention. As the international community moves towards a human rights based approach to drugs, we suggest that the creation of a special procedure mandate, either a special rapporteur or a working group on human rights and drug policy is necessary to develop in a coherent and systematic way the international standards that are necessary to bring a new policy paradigm to reality. Finally, I do really believe that the presentation of this report in Vienna today is a historical moment that builds on the encouraging momentum that we've seen over the 
past decade in firmly centering human rights and UN drug policy debates. And our hope is that true transformational change is coming that heralds a genuine paradigm shift away from repression and punishment towards drug policies that truly prioritize human rights development and social justice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anne. So that concludes our, our wonderful panel uh, discussion, but we do have with us, before I turn the floor to um, for your questions and comments, um, a video as well from our partners at UNDP, um, Mandeep uh, Dalawi, uh, the director of the HIV and Health Group Bureau of Policy and Program Support. We have nice long titles in the UN, um, and we have a video from that team. Thank you. Colleagues and friends, my name is Mandeep Daliwal, and I'm the director of UNDP's HIV and health practice based out of New York. It's my pleasure to join you today. And let me begin first by, on behalf of UNDP, extending our sincere appreciation for OHCHR on this timely report titled Human Rights Challenges in Addressing and Countering All Aspects of the World Drug Problem. The report provides valuable insights on how we can shift towards more evidence-informed and human rights-centered drug policies that benefit health and development and can contribute to scaling our collective efforts in implementing the UN Common Position on Drugs and the 2030 Agenda. The International Guidelines on Human Rights and Drug Policy developed by UNDP, OHCHR, UNAIDS, WHO, the University of Essex, with contributions from other partners such as UNODC, are already playing a pivotal role in shaping drug policies around the world. As we speak in Brazil, these guidelines are informing the policy discourse around drug use and homelessness and racism in law enforcement. By integrating human rights into drug policy, Brazil is addressing the disproportionate impact of drug control measures on marginalized communities, promoting social justice and equity. In Colombia, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, these guidelines are informing drug law reform efforts. The Council of Europe and the European Union have used the guidelines as a framework to guide drug policy initiatives, promoting evidence-based approaches, harm reduction, the protection of human rights, and minimizing punitive approaches. Our deeper collaboration in supporting evidence and rights-based drug policy is vital. The scale of this global challenge demands it. Today, Approximately 296 million people around the world use drugs, with a notable increase in drug use among young people, particularly in Africa. Despite a wealth of evidence, 145 countries still criminalize the use and possession of small quantities of drugs. Such punitive measures hinder access to essential services and perpetuate human rights violations. And women are dispor disproportionately affected by such punitive measures. The link between drug use and HIV is deeply concerning. People who inject drugs are seven times more likely to acquire HIV compared to the general population. The disproportionate risk highlights the urgent need to ensure access to HIV prevention, including harm reduction, as well as treatment and care for people who use drugs. Looking ahead, UNDP looks forward to deepening and expanding our collaboration with OHCHR and other partners to achieve our common goal of ensuring that human rights and development are truly at the heart of drug policy. Together, through the implementation of the UN Common Position and the guidelines, we can make significant progress in addressing the World Drug Challenge, advancing progress on the SDGs, and leaving no one behind. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Vandeep, uh, from UNDP for, for that contribution. Um, so we'll open the floor. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time for questions and comments, but looking forward to receiving a few of them. And understand Alison Crochet from the Ministry of Health in Scotland wanted to come in. Uh, thank you. I mean, just, or just to very, very, very briefly, um, I'm from the um, the, the, the Drug Policy Division Scotland. For, for, for people that don't know, Scotland, Scottish government is a devolved administration of, of the UK um, and part of the devolved uh, um, responsibilities are, are health and drug policy sits very firmly within our health uh, directorate. First of all, can I just say thank you very much uh, to all of the speakers today. We're extremely encouraged um, by, the, uh, by the contributions and the this move towards um, human rights and, and drug policy. It's very important to us. Uh, we launched a, a national mission 
on uh, to reduce drug deaths and uh, improve people's lives two years ago as a result of um, very alarming rates of, of drug-related death in our country. Um, as a result of that, we have um, implemented quite a number of, of uh, drug treatment facilities uh, and you know, trying to improve both the quality and the quantity of, uh, of both drug treatment and harm reduction. But we have um, also, uh, in the, the, the process, learned um, that it's, it's bigger than that. And I think the, harm, the, the, uh, the um, uh, human rights element really brings that to, to fruition. You are uh, 15 times more likely to die of a drug-related death in Scotland if you are in the poorest quant quintile um, of our society than you are in the most wealthy, 15 times more likely. And that tells us that this is all not just to do with um, a medical um, issue, but it's also very much to do with socioeconomic and, and uh, human rights issues. And so we've set up a, a, a national collaborative over the last year, which is led by our human rights professor, Alan Miller, and is um, comprised of uh, people who use drugs and uh, people who work in services. And what we're trying to ascertain, we're, our plan is to, to launch a charter of human rights um, uh, designed and delivered by that group uh, by next year. And what it hopes to do is to articulate um, what a human rights approach looks like uh, to people who use drugs and the people that work close to them and live close to them. Because in our view, um, that needs to that needs to actually you know take hold and we need to know not just what needs to happen but also how that needs to happen and and the the uh, feedback that we've had so far from people who use drugs has has been very much about that not just that they need services but they need services they can use and they need some respect and some um, some agency and I feel that the language of human rights, really has helped them to articulate that and I very much welcome um, the initiatives. This gives a, um, encouragement and credence to that approach for, for them uh, and very much appreciate and thank the, the, the Office of Human Rights for, for this report. Um, and just to say we would be very keen to learn from other countries who may be doing similar things or, or something different that they feel is achieving that same goal. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you so much. And sorry to, to butt in, but uh, unfortunately, I'm being told that we just have a minute. So um, is there anyone else who wanted to come in with a, a very quick question or, or comment? Thank you. Um, I, I think that's probably good because I, I think we have to close quickly. But I do want to go back to the panelists and speakers here to see if anybody had any final remarks. No, we're good. Wonderful. Everybody is looking forward to the sandwiches or, or uh, snacks, which may or may not be. I, I understand there was a, a, a didn't go so smoothly last time we tried this, but we're hoping that we're more successful this time. But um, so we just want to close then by inviting states, national human rights institutions, regional bodies and civil society, including the community of people who use drugs and other stakeholders to use the findings and recommendations from the office's report that we've heard about today to advance the much needed drug policy reforms, which we've been speaking about. Um, we strongly believe that the Commission of Narcotic Drugs and its member states will continue to lead the development and the implementation of human rights-based drug policies around the globe. And we wish uh, everyone success in this endeavor. I again wanna thank uh, the colleagues at the United Nations office in Vienna for their technical support and holding the event. I wanna thank my colleague Zavid Mahmoud, who you all probably know, but is the, the force behind both uh, this report, but our work um, within the office on uh, on these issues for, for a long time and without which we probably wouldn't wouldn't be here. So thanks, thanks to him as well. Thanks to all of you for your rapt attention, but thank you as well for your commitment to take forward some of what we've talked about here today and to make real progress on these important issues. Thank you.